so you can start now okay so on the third day of uh, itihas saptah 3.2 our uh, seventh lecture is being given by shri shiv prasad kanade sir former director national science center delhi former director uh, national gallery of modern art and former director nehru science center mumbai sir is going to talk on the title story of unsung women uh, health warriors so i warmly welcome you sir uh, to this webinar it's a privilege to have you and we are very enthusiastic uh, to listen to your talk and uh, i request ms manali momaya now to introduce uh, shri shiv prasad kanade sir thank you nidhi uh, it's uh, once again a pleasure to host you on our uh, platform sir we had the opportunity to, uh, of listening to sir Uh, last year when we had a panel discussion on the eve of uh, international museum day and it was a really fruitful one uh, shri shiv prasad kenade sir is an electronics and communication engineer who started his career with two multinational companies hewlett packard and intel he then joined the government service in 1986 and has ever since been working with the national council of science museums for 35 years until his retirement in 2021 Kenneji has served as the director of National Science Center New Delhi, uh, Vishweshwaraya Industrial and Technological Museum Bangalore and Nehru Science Center Mumbai. He has also had the distinction of shouldering the additional responsibility of director of the National Gallery of Modern Art Mumbai for 6 years. Uh, to his credit he has 100 or more published articles on science communication and history of science in various international and national level journals. Uh, he has published five exhibition catalogs uh, books and uh, catalog books and monograms uh, he is an avid blogger and has published more than 175 well researched blogs with international following sir has established three new regional science centers uh, one of which is in my university the karnataka university dharwad uh, the other two are at coimbatore and pilikula uh, while he was the director of vishweshwaraya museum bangalore He has also established four new science innovation and activity centers in Maharashtra and several innovation hubs across the country, uh, and also uh, work in involved in the development of science center in Kottayam. He has curated several well-researched science and culture exhibitions, some of which include Sir M. Vishweshwaraya, Ramanujan, Information Revolution, Human Biology, Water, the Elixir of Life, and so on. Uh, he was a sole Uh, India coordinator for the acclaimed Illuminating India 5000 Years of Science and Innovation in India exhibition which was presented at the Science Museum London he is a recipient of the prestigious 16th NES National Award instituted by Sri Jayendra Saraswati Shankaracharya at Kanchi post retirement kenade sir was search come selected as a ceo of pradhan mantri sangrahalaya new delhi and currently he is working as a senior advisor at csmvs Uh, that is chhatrapati uh, shivaji museum uh, shivaji maharaj vastu sangrahalaya uh, mumbai uh, sir with this brief introduction uh, it is now time uh, to listen to uh, shri shiv prasad kenade sir um thank you manali ji um my friend uh, nandan shastri ji is there um nidhi is there i mean and all others who are present um let me i mean i'll first share the screen and then uh, let's say it is there is is this uh, visible yes sir yes sir it is visible okay let me see if i can um slide show sir yes. uh, is it visible now slide show oh, yes sorry. sir uh, it has gone to the last slide yeah yeah i know that's that's i'm sorry yeah is this visible now yeah yes it's visible sir. um you know at the outset let me first uh, congratulate uh, all of you manali nidhi and of course uh, nandan ji uh, for uh, pulling out this wonderful uh, international uh, seminar i mean spread across seven days uh, it's a massive thing and that to doing it online when uh, you know all of us are uh, fed up of this uh, so called uh, online business uh, after you know suffering for almost uh, nearly 3 years we are just about to come out of this online and then uh, go on site but uh, i mean in a way it's uh, it's a blessing in disguise that you know people from across the world come to attend this for example amreshwar ji was there he had just joined from australia so i should congratulate you for this this is a very um when um, 
Manali sent me this uh, um, request for speaking. I was a bit uh, confused. You know, first and foremost, the title is Itihasa Sapta, and I'm from the science, science and history, kind of an oxymoron. Uh, but okay, but uh, having worked with the, the science center and done some kind of his, uh, research on science, uh, I felt okay. But if I did not reply. Here comes Nandanji, always ever present, omnipresent. He one fine day he gives me a call and says, "No, no." I, I try to tell him, reason it out that you know this is such a um, academic kind of a forum. Why do you want me to address this? That too, um, an interesting topic on rewriting her story. Uh, but then he, because of his uh, request, I could not say no to Nandanji. So here I am trying to speak to you. What I've done is, um, and it's a very uh, interesting topic. Based on uh, the the exhibition that we have done, I mean, during my time, about 35, 36 years of uh, service, uh, uh, we had an opportunity to you know research on various subjects. I'm trying. I have tried to pick up only about five or six examples uh, to highlight the role of uh, women, particularly as health warriors. You know, we have still just about managed to come out of uh, this COVID pandemic. So I thought, let me highlight uh, some of them. Who have made uh, contributed immensely yet not spoken about so can we try and tell their um, rewrite their story and then let people come to know about it so this is what i'm going to do um like uh, i briefly talked about this uh, joining a science museum has got its own uh, advantages and disadvantages uh, when we started we started as a national council of science museum so there was an emphasis on uh, objects Objects, I mean, one, if you have original objects, you can tell stories. But then gradually, of course, the first two museums, the, the first one in uh, Calcutta, Birla Industrial Technological Museum, uh, and the second one in uh, Bangalore, Vishweshwara Industrial Technological Museum, even today, the VITM, I think, receives close to about um, 9 lakh visitors every year and very, very famous. They all started uh, under uh, the, the CSIR. Subsequently, when the third museum came, a new concept came, a new concept of uh, what's called as a science center. It started from uh, exploratorium. Um, from that, uh, I think the, the, con uh, the, the whole emphasis has changed from object oriented to more interactive kind of a thing. So in the process of doing interactive thing, what happens is you tend to lose out on the original objects. So when you don't have original objects, there is limited opportunity for you to connect with the audience. Or the, I mean, the objects are your own heritage, a part of your heritage. Just your predecessors who have passed on those uh, objects which create their own culture, uh, the technology and things like that. Uh, when you don't have that, uh, you've got to uh, work more closely to on certain subjects, which um, particularly on science and technology to connect to people. So during my course of uh, service, I've done a lot of these such exhibitions. And from those exhibitions, um, suiting your subject of uh, rewriting uh, her story, I have picked up a couple of examples. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, these very few examples, just I think about uh, six examples. And maybe I will try and finish it off as early as possible, um, maybe about 20, 20 minutes, 20, 25 minutes. The first and foremost, uh, most important thing is uh, an organization called as ASHA. I'm sure most of you must be must have heard about this. It's called as the Accredited Social Health Activists. There are about a million people, million ladies, unsung heroes. I mean, we have passed through the, the COVID pandemic. Of course, there are deaths. But uh, if you compare the health infrastructure that is available for, that was available for us, and also the population density and the innumerable challenges when it comes to, in terms of uh, uh, sanitation, availability of bed and things like that. Uh, yet, I think we have fared much, much better than most uh, developed countries. We always tend to give credit to the, the, the major health workers, which are, you know, the doctor, the nurses and such others. Definitely, they do deserve uh, all our uh, appreciation and so also the administrators. But uh, standing like a rock to reach out to every nook and corner of the country where these health workers, the women, primarily all these women, they served as a major health workers. Uh, I'm sure you must have read in the newspapers also, there is so much of uh, vaccine hesitancy in countries like US, UK, most of the European countries, but not in India. 
so this is something interesting so for that i think the credit should go to the health workers you know the asha the about they are about a million people so i'll be covering talking about that and incidentally just last year they have been um, um recognized by the world health organization that's one and again and i'm trying to tell their uh, story rewrite their story so that all of you um understand and appreciate and revel these unsung women the next one every one of us have uh, heard about florence nightingale when we talk about uh, nurses in india we call them as sisters with respect um everybody talks about florence nightingale she is that she is that quintessential nurse that everyone remembers uh she is also known as a lady with the lamp but one thing which is completely missing uh, from the discourse from the public discourse uh, most of the people will not be aware that she was also a great mathematician a statistician to be precise um she has definitely saved a lot of lives um using her extraordinary uh, skills as a nurse and inspired millions and millions of uh, health workers particularly the nurses but what should be remembered here is that she has also saved a lot of lives using her statistical knowledge to bring about effective information on the importance of uh, health hygiene and sanitation which was actually killing people this is the second one which i'll be covering the third one is uh, a lady called as uh, margaret hutchinson i'm not sure how many of you will be remembering that but uh, you ask a quiz question to even a school student anyone in india or abroad um who discovered uh, penicillin immediately comes the answer uh, fleming's name comes into the picture but uh, is it that i mean was he able to do that and the the antibiotics or the, the penicillins and such other antibiotic that we all uh, take and you know they save us from bacterial infection um is it because of him or something else it was here this lady comes into the picture margaret hutchinson um this my story on margaret hutchinson is based on an exhibition that we had developed it's um, i'll be talking about that the next one is again based on another exhibition that uh, i had the honor to curate it was called human genome and beyond when i say genome the way you know the archaeology and history talks about our past but how does the life itself govern itself you know that's central to life understanding the life elixir of life or the, the language of life is what's called as a dna so this when we talk about the structure of dna there are three scientists who have got the nobel prize for dna discovery of the dna but there is one lady scientist who has been completely neglected so she is that unsung uh, hero scientist that's uh, rosalind franklin i'll be speaking about uh, rosalind franklin then there is another lady anandi bai joshi the first medical doctor from india incidentally very recently in the at the chatrapati shivaji museum where i am presently working there was an exhibition called as change makers these were all uh, women of the the later part of the 19th and uh, 20th century who have made pro- transformational social changes one of the lady who was featured in this exhibition is anandi bai joshi she was the first medical professional medical doctor who completed her uh, medicine from uh, pennsylvania us i'll be talking about her of course she lived a very sh- very short life but yet has been inspirational to the most of the ladies then there is another lady i'll just briefly touch about uh, this lady uh, june almeida um and using her name because uh, the corona has become a part of our life you know the, the covid or corona virus that very word corona virus how does it look like you know this uh, um see the, the how this corona virus looks like was she was the first to visualize this uh, corona virus and those corona like uh, type of things which we all see she was the first to visualize uh, using the electron microscope so these are the people whose stories have uh, perhaps not reached the people can we write try and tell these stories to to our audience um i talked about asha you know in uh, in 2005 when the the upa1 came into the picture came um we uh, started ruling um they introduced uh, manmohan singh ji introduced what is known as a national rural health mission uh, most of us who are uh, living in the cities or you know cl- tier 1 or tier 2 cities are having some kind of a access to health but imagine india is a country with uh, 600000 villages what happens to the health infrastructure in village 
it's not available so this national rural health mission was primarily aimed at reaching out to every nook and corner of the country particularly the villages so how do we reach this such a vast space uh, which cuts across from you know the the kashmir to kanyakumari to the northeast to uh, to the the deserts in rajasthan how do we reach all of them so this new concept of asha came into the picture this accredited um social health activists you know health activists these are actually I mean supposed to be uh, kind of a voluntary service so each of the villages so they have selected one representative lady in the age of age group of 25 to 40 preferably with um, some kind of a matriculation and they give them um, primary education in terms of primary health awareness etc so these are the people who have been the foot soldiers of all the health missions in india trying to reach out to every nook and corner for example vaccination let's take the case of uh, polio eradication in india you know polio is such a dangerous um, a uh, deb um, um, debilitating uh, disease it's now completely wiped out from india in 2013 there was a national immunization program but how do we reach out to every single child and um, give those uh, oral polio vaccines on those chosen national immunization day this was primarily done because, um, with the help of these uh, health workers now there are there are about 1 million such uh, asha workers across the country this program began with, um, I think, just about um, 10 states and uh, seven northeast, uh, northeastern states. And now it has spread across the country. And they are the people who have been primarily responsible for the, the avoidance of vaccine hesitancy. They go from door to door. Um, if you re, um, Even the infant mortality has come down. Awareness among the, the women um, in, in terms of menstruation, uh, health. Um, going to the doctors for uh, delivery and all these things have have vastly improved because of these ASHA health workers. Another reason why ASHA health workers, um, the, the, the villages were able to connect to their own person. Each of these ASHA health workers be belong to the same village. They share the same cultural, social, all habits of that particular village. And these people will be knowing every um, ladies or a gents or a kids. In children of those villages. So this program became a highly successful one. And no wonder the World Health Organization has recognized uh, um, ASHA as one of the, you know, they are called as the, the, the global world health leaders. You know, last year, the 2022, um, when uh, the World Health Organization was organizing 75th uh, um, event program, this uh, organization, ASHA, got the recognition. So today, we must understand and try to retell the stories of these unsung, faceless 1 million women workers. This is the first story. Now, you know, one of the first thing when the, the COVID started, all of us know that, you know, hand hygiene, you know, we have to wash our hands or, uh, you know, sanitize our hands and things like that. It became a, the mass movement, particularly in India and other places. But then how did this concept of... Uh, the hand hygiene come into the picture. So when we did uh, a lot of programs due on the COVID, including an exhibition on uh, what COVID is all about, um, we did talk about a gentleman who actually introduced this uh, hand hygiene system. He's unsung. Although he's a male, I'm using him because he more or less uh, his uh, lifespan, he was born around the time when Florence Nightingale was born. I'm trying to compare this great man who was not able to educate his own people regarding the importance of health hygiene or hand hygiene. Whereas being a woman, being discriminated against, Florence Nighting was able to effectively communicate the, the importance of uh, sanitation, primarily because she used uh, what are known as uh, the, the pie charts or the, the visual diagrams using the statistical method to communicate to the people. So I'll be talking about her a bit later. But I will um, briefly talk about this man, uh, Samuel Weiss. Ignaz Samuel Weiss, basically, he was born in uh, Hungary. Um, he wanted to do his law. But then, I mean, he was so fortunate to listen to one. I mean, he went with one of his friends uh, to a medical college and he listened to a lecture. And then it was, the lecture was so inspiring to him that he decided to become a doctor. So he completed his medicine, um, medical degree. And he was so very fortunate to, um, to get a, a small post 
uh, in one of the most highly respected uh, uh, medical hospital in uh, in vienna the, you can see in the visual at the right corner you have this uh, the one of the oldest uh, uh, hospital in vienna where um, uh, uh, igna semen weiss uh, got his posting the posting was actually um, made in uh, in a in a medical you know the the gynec ward where uh, the ladies were uh, delivering there were actually two um, wards one ward i mean where they pull up a men in advanced pregnancy uh, the the delivery of this uh, uh, ward ward 1 was being done by the midwives whereas the delivery of the uh, the second one was done by uh, the doctors so interestingly um, can you see this is there any problem So the slideshow has uh, stopped. You just have to. Oh, oh my! That's what I was just wondering. Something happened. Uh, you can just. Can you see this now? One second. You can see. Uh, we are only seeing the. Group. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, now it's visible. Uh, um, earlier it was visible. Yes, yes, sir. Now you can you visible. can see it now? No. Yes, yes. Now it's fine, sir. It's a. Uh, it's in full screen or no? Uh. Again, again, sir. Multiple slides are there. Yeah, now, now it's visible, sir. Perfect. Okay. So, mm, so I'm sorry. Yeah, this is this gentleman, mm, Ignaz Semenweis. Oh, uh, what he 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 realized that uh, when the delivery is made by the medical doctors, the the, the professional uh, medical doctors, and also the students who are undergoing uh, medicine, the number of deaths. were higher than when the delivery was being done by midwives it's a very interesting question i mean this was a the profound uh, um, evidence but yet no doctor was ready to believe that when the doctors do the delivery the number of deaths are more in fact uh, the ratio is pretty high there were almost about 9 people dying 9 to 10 people dying um, when uh, the delivery was done by uh, the doctors whereas when it was done by housewives midwives um, it was just about two He 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 had this question. He asked to himself, "Why are the people dying?" I am talking about the period about eighteen forty forty five or so during that period. What he realized is, uh, he didn't know that germ theory that time. We did not know that uh, the the microbial um, things like you know the bacteria, virus, and things like that they spread the disease. This awareness was not available. We did not have Pasteur. We did not have Robert Koch. So this awareness was not available. um samuel weiss uh, soon realized that why this is happening is he noted that uh, the doctors they were actually performing autopsy that means they were actually working with this corpse dead bodies trying to understand the inner uh, uh, working systems of the dead body anatomy of the human body so so as to understand medicine better immediately after um, doing the autopsy and working with the, the human dead body to understand anatomy they used to come here without even washing their hands they used to perform the the delivery so that time the, the question of bacteria and information was not available so samuel weiss uh, immediately realized uh, there is something known as a these people are carrying cadaver material cadaver material means into the dead bodies so the, he felt that there are carrying something from the cadaver because they did some uh, kind of you know, um, um they worked with this uh, anatomical bodies so they carried something from there and that must have been the responsibility uh, that must have led to the death of people but when he made this statement basically what he was trying to tell is he was trying to blame the doctors that you are actually killing uh, women this no doctor like everybody went against him and they literally tried to boycott him so what he did um he started searching all the records one record he found was uh, one of the doctors um, uh, from the forensic department had died on a similar condition what happened is he noted that uh, accidentally one surgical knife which was used again for the autopsy of the, the dead bodies for understanding the anatomy had accidentally touched this doctor and due to that same disease which the women were uh, dying that was called as a purpural fever he died so he linked some kind of a connection between these two and finally realized that if you try to do go for a hand hygiene it may improve so he asked some of his uh, fellow doctors who actually believed him while most of the people were not believing 
some of the junior doctors they resorted to what is known as a using chlorine for washing the hands and started doing the the um, um, the delivery immediately what happened is this led to the same number the number of deaths came down further than what the midwives were doing so this was the first case of using of hand hygiene which is extremely important but nobody believed him they shunted him out in fact they were did not even give him a regular job they shunted him out from uh, vienna he came back to his own place in hungary again there too he did the same thing no doctors ever believed him he went to such an extent that he called the doctors as murderers finally every doctor um, actually i mean boycotted him he became um, a psychic patient he was admitted to the, to the lunatic asylum and he was actually beaten to death so such has been his story but nobody knew about him only after his death uh, after his death people realized the significance of hand hygiene and which became very useful tool particularly during the covid times so i wanted to bring about a context in this to before connecting to florence nightingale i don't know how many of you uh, have uh, heard about the crimean war which the the turkish or the ottoman empire was fighting with the russians hopefully some of you must have heard otherwise you can google um, i'm sure some of you must have read this uh, poem charge of the light brigade so uh, the ottoman empire was joined by two other um, european forces one the england english um, army and the french army joined them to fight the the russians russian was a very very powerful army so all these people were fighting fighting at this uh, place um, in the present day you know uh, ukraine around that area so it was during this time that uh, florence nightingale um, who actually you know was born in those uh, unorthodox times when uh, women were not supposed to be educated although she was in england yet but she was very very intelligent she looked around the house and when she came from a relatively royal uh, background she got herself self educated and she became interested uh, in nursing and she went and joined uh, a hospital you can see the um, she had photograph among the, all other nurses and she was fortunate that it was during this time that the, the battle was going on uh, um, um, and she volunteered to go and join this battle as uh, a nurse and she went to, um, there you can see in the in the photograph every day she joined she was joined by um, her other uh, nurses every day she days to go all these nurses used to go work day and night to treat the wounded soldiers you know the soldiers particularly the british soldiers the french soldiers and also the ottoman empire the, the turkish soldiers they were all being treated by her um and that's the reason you know there was a very famous uh, poem which was written by wordsworth uh, longfellow uh, a lady with the lamp you know every day she he used to see her and then you know going and attending to this um, the patients uh, so she became very famous known as a lady with the lamp you can see this beautiful uh, oil on canvas painting uh, reflecting of uh, uh, the the florence nightingale so now let comes uh, when what she did when she she was able to definitely bring about a lot of change but when she was attending to all the the patients uh, the basically the wounded soldiers uh, who were coming in large large numbers you must understand that during this battle um the, during the crimean war close to about 2 3 million soldiers died what she realized is uh, the number of soldiers who were dying out of the bullet injuries or uh, the wounds from the battlefield was much much lower than the number of uh, deaths that were taking place because of some diseases what were those diseases malaria i mean such other things infectious diseases it was very odd for her that you know the soldiers are dying out of uh, because of the sanitation was not good you know the dead bodies were just outside there was no um, uh, sanitation when it comes to uh, uh, the uh, lavatories and such other thing there was hardly any sanitation so these soldiers they were wounded but their own they were getting infected by some of the other uh, microbial um, bacteria and this was leading to large number of deaths when she tried to tell this to the the army people uh, and um, inform them that look you have to improve the health conditions but the sanitation has to be improved the the cleanliness has to be improved initially they were not ready to listen to her because you know they um, the time i mean the money was a factor the little amount of money has to be invested more on uh, war times than this so what they were not listening to her 
so she used her wonderful statistical knowledge to produce what is called as the diagram of the causes of mortality in the army in the east you can see this diagram there what she did is the battle stretched on from 19 in the 1854 to about 1856 or so she made this beautiful pie like uh, looking charts which are present in present days you know every business organization presentation use pie charts or bar charts the first lady to use this as a visualization tool was actually um, rosalind franklin you can see in the in this picture she has represented the number of people dying out of exactly because of the wounds that they suffered uh, of um, from the bullets in the in the battle and those people who are dying due to some other reason then there is a large number of people who are dying because of lack of sanitation and such other um, infectious diseases the number of people who are dying out of infectious diseases far outnumbered those people who are dying out of uh, dying from the bullets or from the war, the war battle injuries you know this was a turning point the british um, military officers uh, understood the significance of this of course it was not that easy for her she had to write to so many people she had to use her contact in the media to write about this ultimately they realized this and when they made changes improved the sanitation the death rates came down drastically today you know in 2020 it was the 200 years of um, uh, the birth um, so uh, 200 years of the birth anniversary of um, um uh, rosalind franklin i mean this uh, uh, florence nightingale today i mean just recently we completed the nurses day nursing nurses day also international nurse day we must remember her not only as a nurse an extraordinary quintessential nurse but also as a great statistician who has helped to help the medical fraternity to record uh, statistics about health this has immensely helped during the particularly during the time of covid now let's come to the next one next hero the antibiotics when i say antibiotics first thing that comes to our mind is uh, the penicillin now penicillin was the first antibiotic which was extensively used subsequently you know we use uh, so many number of antibiotics which save us from lot of bacterial diseases but uh, you know in um we had done one exhibition called as uh, uh um, super bugs um, is it the end of antibiotics when doing this exhibition you know i came across um, i was trying to read and understand um how did the beginning of the antibiotics uh, and uh, such other things in the process of doing this i i mean you, incidentally this exhibition got some outstanding coverage you can see the newspaper coverage is normally science doesn't get uh, such vast coverage but fortunately this exhibition got a lot of coverage so here comes this man alexander fleming when i talk about antibiotic everybody immediately says penicillin was discovered by um alexander fleming correct he but one must understand that his discovery was serendipitous it was an accidental discovery because he was he was a man he used to work with the bacteria particularly he was trying to culture and develop this bacteria staphylococci he used to work on that and um, uh, he had taken it off and then he had um, made some um, in the petri dish he was developing this staph staphylococci and then he had gone on some 10 or 12 days holidays when he came back he found that there was a, there was a green mold which had developed and surrounding that mold he noticed that the the bacteria which he had he had cultured they were all dead so that was a profound discovery but it was accidental it was not an incidental i mean it was not what he wanted but an accidental serendipitous discovery which is extremely useful but that was not that's not the end of the story he did discover it that discover that in 1928 itself but then he himself realized that it is extremely difficult to develop the culture for developing this mold penicillin as a mold it was extremely difficult but it took two other scientists uh, one as an australian one of course he was in cambridge um sir robert walter flory and the other gentleman ernst boris chain these two scientists worked on this trying to culture and develop this in the lab so that you can use this penicillin for mass production but they only they were able to prove that it can be cultured you must also remember that alexander fleming uh, although he had discovered this he himself had made a statement that there is no way that uh, penicillin can be developed for using it for uh, as an antibiotic he himself had made that statement subsequently the other two helped in culturing that all the three of them went on to receive the nobel prize for medicine in 
But one lady who is missing in this is the one who has brought about the transformational changes. You are able to produce penicillin, but what is the use if you are not able to produce it in the, the factory level? Factory level means I should be able to produce millions of such penicillin, what you are seeing in the, in the picture. So, you know, uh, that was the time when war had broken up and broken out, the Second World War was going on, and the number of soldiers who were dying because of these bacterial infections was um, going by leaps and bounds. So, they desperately wanted this penicillin. You know, they were able to produce penicillin um, to such extent that maximum it was able to cure only one patient in one year. How do we mass produce this? So, England joined hands and, you know, with uh, America, and there was a challenge thrown open to the people. Can we come up with a system or a mechanism or an engineering design, how it can be mass manufactured? Here comes this lady by name Margaret Hutchinson. She was, uh, she was the, incidentally, she's the first lady who did her uh, master's in chemical engineering in MIT. She also obtained her PhD in um, uh, chemical engineering. And she also got, came into the picture. She started, uh, she was one among those people who were trying to research and find a solution to that. Using her own um, examples of working uh, on chemical uh, engineering company with some of the companies, she came out with a system known as uh, deep tank fermentation process. This was a turning point. They, uh, she joined hands with the uh, Pfizer company and they used one old ice factory and they started mass producing uh, the penicillin um, using this uh, deep tank fermentation process. And in just about a year, they were able to produce millions of such penicillin. Today, when you know these antibiotics uh, can save millions of lives across the world, we must remember this lady, unsung lady, whose story has not been written. She was responsible for uh, uh, you know bringing out an engineering design to mass produce this. So now I come to the next lady who again missed out on the Nobel Prize. We know that structure of DNA, I mean, which is an extremely important uh, chemical, uh, it actually is, uh, is what actually governs the life, how uh, the DNA is able to produce or reproduce cells and what is supposed to happen. Um, all these things, this, uh, what is called as a program of life is there in DNA. So there was a whole lot of rush for finding out the structure of DNA. And uh, two people who are working on this is uh, James Watson and Francis Crick. There is another gentleman who was, wo I mean, who was working in, Cam uh, in the King's College. His name is uh, Maurice Wilkins. He did nothing, incidentally. If there was another lady, unsung lady, Rosalind Franklin. She, uh, she was also working with uh, Maurice Wilkins, and she had great interest in X-ray um, crystallography. For, and she was a specialist in uh, taking, out, taking photographs using the X-ray crystallography. That was a new um, technology used during those times. And uh, it was able to tell uh, the, the structure of the, uh, the proteins, chemicals, and such things. She took one such photograph, a very famous photograph known as photograph number 51. I will not go into the science part of it. This is the next one. What you see in the left is that famous photograph uh, which was taken by Rosalind Franklin. Um, this photograph uh, was, uh, without taking her permission, it went into the hands of uh, James Watson. So Watson and Crick were already working on this. This gave them the clue of that the DNA, the structure of DNA must be a double helix and not a triple helix. Incidentally, there was another great scientist by name Linus Pauling, who is, who is the winner of two Nobel Prizes, and he's considered one of the best of chemists. He had suggested the structure of DNA could be triple helix. But Watson and um, Crick were conclusively able to prove and uh, publish a paper on uh, uh, the structure of DNA, primarily because of this photograph. Unfortunately, Rosalind Franklin died a bit early before uh, the Nobel Prizes were announced. I'm sure even if the Nobel Prizes were announced when she was alive, she would have been deprived. And no, when we talk about the, the structure of DNA or who discovered DNA, no one talks about Rosalind Franklin. So her unwritten story has, I mean, I think we must rewrite and every one of us must know the contribution of Rosalind Franklin. This is, uh, you know, this um, uh, two of the people, James Watson and Francis Crick, both of them have written as their own autobiographical book on how did they discover uh, DNA, but none of them have actually given the due credit which should have gone to Rosalind Franklin. So just I will end with two more people and briefly I will talk about uh, Anandi Bai Joshi. I know she was, uh, I mean, born in 1865. During those times, even British 
there was so much of a gender discrimination you can imagine what could have been her case she was born here in thane even her mother um she never encouraged her to um study she always used to encourage her to go to the the kitchen for doing uh, um household works and uh, preparation of food and things like that like most women during those times she was married off at a very young age when she was just about 9 years and uh, as usual her name uh, also was changed um from her uh, um uh, original name to anandi bai and she was married to a gentleman by name uh, mr joshi but her husband was a great man she he always believed in, um, in you know encouraging women to study so he always encouraged his, his wife to study she was just about 9 years and by the age of 14 years she did deliver a child and unfortunately the child died it was during that time that she she took interest to becoming a, a gynecologist um her husband also helped her um they went to calcutta from there and then her husband tried the best tried his best to uh, you know get some scholarship he was not a, he was not successful but somehow managed he and uh, his wife anandi bai both of them were supposed to go to um, pennsylvania for uh, her medical education but he was not able to raise the amount that was required but he used various uh, methods including you know use publishing uh, in some um, um uh, the the journals were, were which were used by the christian missionaries for uh, popularizing uh, christianity and fortunately one of the one of this article came to the notice of one lady a very kindly kind hearted lady in uh, pennsylvania uh, one miss uh, carpenter she noticed her interest and invited uh, anandi bai to pennsylvania and rest is history she went on to become the first indian medical doctor and her thesis was very interestingly obstetrics among aryan hindus she wrote a thesis on that primarily because she had lost her child unfortunately although she completed her she did get her uh, medical degree came back but during those times uh, she was not able to adjust to the the american conditions including the the cold weather so she suffered from i mean she was affected by tuberculosis she came back to india and then over a long uh, sea voyage and within a um, few months of her joining uh, kolapur as a doctor she died but yet although she died in just when she was 22 years of age uh, all of us i'm sure uh, everyone will now remember her, her contribution and uh, incidentally the indian national science academy has come out with a book uh, called as leela leelavati's daughters and she's one of the lady who has been featured in that uh, story the last lady i just briefly speak about her june almeda and taking the name of uh, june almeda primarily because uh, um, you can see the corona virus how does it look like the the structure or the visualization of this corona virus which actually rampaged the world and you know it's taken millions of lives she was the first lady to use electron microscope to give the structure of this so she too is uh, has remained unsung until now or maybe because of the covid pandemic people have started researching and trying to understand her contribution she was again not she was just a lab technician later on educated herself um, on her own and published a lot of these papers including the one on uh, the visualization structure of uh, coronavirus uh, since time is very short i think i had to end by 6 o'clock uh, now it's already 6 7 and in fact the museum also is going to be closed i will close uh, um, my lecture with this but uh, you know incidentally i have written uh, some of my detailed blogs on florence nightingale igna semelweis the corona virus and including uh, you know the the superbugs exhibition and the role of uh, margaret hutchinson which are uh, given in my uh, links here in this uh, slide so with this uh, brief uh, um, uh, presentation i think i will end my talk and i hope i have been able to do justice to the topic that you had which was quite a challenge for me as a science man trying to talk about itihas and that too talking about the itihas of women unsung women and trying to tell their story rewrite that story um thank you once again for giving me this opportunity um to to be a part of your wonderful seminar thank you thank you so much sir absolutely you have done justice to the uh, topic uh, given that this year's theme of international museum day is sustainability and well being and also uh, when we talk about women and heritage women and museums uh, we have heritage which is Uh, not just culture and not just temples there are different kinds of heritage and uh, medical science 
is also part of it because we have that heritage we have gotten it from our ancestors and these women have played a very very important role in developing medical science and it is very important uh, to note their achievements and to remember them for what they have done for us so definitely it was a very very wonderful and uh, eye opening lecture for us sir uh, being women ourselves and as students of history uh, some of these names were new to us also and therefore uh, thank you for bringing them to our notice sir thank you so much uh, maybe i can take it one or two questions if there are any i mean sure sir there is one question by uh, nandan shastri sir <laughs> uh, i'm sure you have encouraged research scholars to find out unsung female health workers in karnataka your native state is there any health museum in karnataka other than brain museum in nimhans bengaluru um i think um, there are not many health museums in, uh, in the country itself uh, but there are efforts going on to to have this health museum um i'm sure each of these medical um, um, colleges uh, will will start having their own small little health museum here for example in uh, mumbai i know um, there's a heritage building and then uh, the uh, old students work it's about um, uh, the jj hospital is about 100 120 150 years old the all of the the alumni of uh, the hospital they have all joined hands together to develop one museum i'm sure such efforts will come up um uh, nimhans if you really look at nimhans uh, second is one area i think there are a lot of women um, doctors uh, if you go to nimhans i'm sure uh, i know there's one uh, dr jayshri ramesh um, she was phenomenal uh, outstanding uh, psychiatrist and there'll be many more um yes you're right so that when you have such uh, health museums perhaps we can uh, chronicle the stories of uh, women um, health workers and including maybe anandi bai joshi of the first uh, the formal uh, allopathic medical doctor yes sir absolutely and uh, i do remember the colleges uh, such as karnataka institute of medical science here in hubli uh, they have regular exhibitions uh, but there is not a dedicated museum so i think that can be something which has to be a work upon uh if any other participants have any questions i request them to raise your hand and uh, unmute yourself and we can ask we do have time for one last question <clears throat> so when we talk about the ancient uh, indian uh, uh, society uh, there were uh, we have the names of uh, people like charaka and sushruta are there any names of women who were in the medical field of those times uh i mean not to the best of my knowledge and of course you you talked about the charaka samhita shushruta samhita and um, these are you know they have been pro uh, phenomenal profound in fact uh, shushruta's uh, contribution in terms of uh, surgery is something which is uh, unprecedented mm. um, uh, so in the case with charaka i mean what we call as ayurveda today it comes from the the original text of charaka charaka samhita or i mean the the surgical instrument that you see modern day surgical instruments um if you really look at these surgical instruments and compare them with uh, the instrument that uh, um shushruta used they are similar uh, the primary um, difference is that these people were observers of nature most of the surgical instrument that uh, were devised by shushruta were was observing nature for example uh, even the the grass when you when you touch it you know the grass blade of a grass can cut so precision cutting i mean the you can just about touch the 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 skin um, just outer layer the epidermis so such kind of thing he devised a lot of about 123 such surgical instruments we had used in an exhibition which went to america under the theme as festival of india there are of course i mean i am not sure about the women uh, part of it but i would appeal to all of you the, it's a freely available downloadable uh, book uh, called as uh, leelavathi's daughters this is uh, a book which features uh, uh, the scientists women scientists uh, who have excelled and this is a book published by indian national science academy sure sir thank you and uh, when uh, talking about the surgical instruments of uh, sushruta i remember the uh, regional science center harvard has a display of yes yes yes, yes. <laughs> there is a heritage exhibition there and a beautiful exhibition which is of course there are no original objects but then the the story telling telling part of uh, part of it i understand from the dharwad university that lot of uh, foreign visitors who come to the university they are brought there for seeing the heritage exhibition yes i in fact 
whenever I have guests over, I also take them to the regional science center because it's such a wonderful place. So I had the honor to curate this uh, our science and technology heritage mission. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Um, uh, as there are no other questions, I think we have come to the end of this session. Uh, I request Ms. Nadi Katti to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Manali. Uh, so it was really a wonderful lecture and uh, you actually proved that there is a, a scope in science to uh, to get connected with history. Of course, uh, from earlier itself, you know, but uh, uh, through putting light on these women of science uh, and uh, health sector, uh, today you have uh, constructed her story in true manners. Thank you so much, sir, for such a wonderful talk. Uh, it was a very, very uh, knowledgeable lecture. Thank you so much. And uh, I also thank our honorable president, uh, Sri Nandan Shastri, sir, and president, Ms. Manali Momaya, uh, and for all the audience of, uh, to, uh, uh, for being uh, uh, active throughout the session. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. So I'll log out. So there are people already waiting to log this room. <laughs> so this is a museum, you know, I'm part of it. I'm there in the exhibition hall. So <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you, you so sir. much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you sir. Bye. Uh, uh, for the uh, notice of the participants, we will be beginning the paper presentation session in five minutes. So kindly join back. We are ending this meeting here. And uh, join back in five minutes for the paper presentation. Thank you all. Uh, we will not re uh, reschedule anybody's papers. If you are not present in the session allotted to you, uh, your paper will stand cancelled. It will be published in the uh, abstract volume, but you will not be given a chance to present it later. Recording stopped.